plan to have um, in the upcoming months. And uh, the importance of, of Narcan in our community, I don't think can be um, overstated or, or emphasized more. Um, tonight, there will be an opportunity to see a, a video here that will be coming up shortly. And uh, you'll hear from uh, a number of tribal members, um, myself included. Um, and really uh, an opportunity to share um, thoughts and stories uh, regarding Narcan and its benefits and its use within our community. Um, I uh, want to take the opportunity just to welcome all who will be tuning in and, and taking this opportunity to learn a little more about an important resource within the community. I want to thank uh, uh, the Health and Wellness and Behavioral Health Program for the opportunity um, to share this uh, valuable information and uh, thank the panel for their uh, participation and, and opportunity to educate our community. Um, it's a, an honor to, to be here to open tonight and to have participated in the video. And I, I thank everybody for uh, being here and for attending. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you. And before I turn this over to Julia Joyce, I want to let you all know, whoever's tuning in with us tonight, that uh, we are going to be doing a question and answer session. So if you have questions for the panel, for Officer Hagreen, please uh, don't hesitate to send your questions in. I will let the panel members know, or myself, you can, you can ask whoever you would like to ask. I will pass the question along to the panel member and we'll come up with an answer for you. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Julia. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing the screen. And one of the things that I want uh, you guys to know about this video is that this is the first time that we have had the opportunity to show this video. So I'm super excited about it. Um, and here you go. I have various friends and family from within our community who have um, also struggled with addiction, specifically with, with opioids. And uh, I also have immediate family and extended family and friends who have suffered overdose. Some of those folks who are here today wouldn't be if it wasn't for Narcan being readily available in our community. And, and some of those folks today are doing very well, but they are also bleeding sober. And after having uh, been saved via Narcan, we're able to find a way to get help and to do the work uh, that it takes for them to, to also sort of be clean and sober one day at a time uh, today. First time I died, um, I was just driving by the travel store down here and uh, I seen somebody come running around the corner from the store and then we pulled into the store and uh, Somebody asked, you know, uh, anybody got any Narcan, Narcan, you know? And, you know, I said, yeah, yeah, you know. So, you know, I got out of the car and, you know, went over and took a look. And, you know, I seen this young man who was just, you know, pretty bad shape. You know, so I had uh, administered two Narcan. We compare the death rate of overdose to how many people have been reversed due to Narcan, the reversals are so much more than the death rate at this point, which is great. And you can tell when like services are less because the overdose rate and the death rate becomes higher. I've been uh, revived off Narcan a couple times. Yeah, about four times or something like that. When people are in addiction, sometimes they feel trapped like there's no success, there's no outcome other than using drugs and not doing anything. Uh, I remember sitting in my car one day thinking, I'm not getting any younger. I don't have nothing going for me in my life. How am I going to get out of this? Feeling stuck. I got a phone call and they said somebody's overdosing. 
So we have Narcan, uh, the EIB, hold on. And I start digging all over, like, where's that kid at? And then I, I, I happened to find it, and then I went over to the spot. So it's important to have it at a spot where you know where it's at. I had a brother overdose on heroin when he was incarcerated. And that kind of motivated me more to learn what could have saved his life. Why wasn't he safe? Why did he have to overdose? You're overdosing, and there's probably going to be drugs somewhere on the premise of the house, or you may be in your own, your meat session. Nothing's going to come out. We may take the drugs and just do what's called a case for disposal, but you won't get any new charges from having those drugs on you. So if you call and there's drugs in the room or even on you, or the person's obviously used drugs, none of you will be prosecuted for anything like that. So it's to encourage people to call and get help and, and yeah, not be afraid to call us because we want to help, but we're not going to be able to help without a call. The overdose is a quiet phenomenon, and that's actually why it's so dangerous. It looks like a person going to sleep, and they may be snoring in a very odd or loud way. Breathing slows way down and eventually stops. A person's skin tone will look different and may turn kind of ashy or blue. The thing to do if you suspect an overdose is to try to wake the person up. And the way to do that is to just take your knuckles and rub them on their chest bone. It's called a sternal rub. When you rub hard, you're not going to hurt them, but it will definitely wake them up. If they don't wake up, you should assume they're never going to wake up. And you need to leap in immediately to emergency response mode. And that emergency response mode should involve calling 911 to get help, telling them with a, you're with a person who's having a breathing emergency, that you get you the quickest, fastest, best aid. Then what you want to do is you want to give them a couple of quick rescue breaths, and you basically pinch their nose, tilt their head back, cover their mouth with your mouth, give them a couple of quick breaths, but if they don't start breathing on their own, you want to immediately give them Narcan. And you literally um, open the box, take off the portal back, insert the device in the nostril, give it one phone squirt. You want to continue doing rescue breathing at that point. If a person's not breathing, you want to keep breathing for them. If they haven't started breathing on their own within a couple of minutes, you want to give the second dose of Narcan. The thing to remember about an opioid overdose is it is an emergency of a lack of oxygen. And your goal is to get them oxygen. You can get them oxygen by calling 911 and having medics come and give oxygen. You can get them oxygen by you breathing for them. And you can get them oxygen by giving them Narcan or Naloxone, which will cause them to breathe on their own. It's all about oxygen. So whenever you're in doubt, think, I want to get them oxygen as quickly and as consistently as possible. Somebody who is suffering overdose could die and Narcan can prevent that from happening. It, it's a difference maker. When you talk about somebody who's suffering and in the midst of uh, an overdose, it's a life or death situation. And Narcan can make a difference. It can make a difference between somebody living and somebody dying. And if you have the ability to put that resource to work for um, your community and the people that you care about, it's a no-brainer. We want to help everybody learn how to reverse an overdose because you never know when you're going to be put in that situation. Whether or not you have addiction in your family, you could have it next door, across the street, just going to the store. I was at, I was at a stoplight the other day and paramedics were reviving a person at the stoplight. You can still change. Um, I ended up doing it. And now I work for my tribe, bringing people to treatment or going out and giving out Narcan's. You know, with the epidemic going on, they've been doing, um, handing out Narcan to, you know, um, with our behavioral health program, you know, to assist in overdose and stuff to, you know, for the safety precautions. If somebody wanted to get Narcan, they could just go to the Muckle Shoot Pharmacy and ask for it, or they could come to Muckle Shoot Behavioral Health and ask the front desk, and one of us would get it for them.
So thank you very much for paying attention with that. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point so far? Okay, nothing. There are no questions, not okay. at this time. So that everybody knows, anyone that has attended this webinar will be able to access um, two of the Narcan kits that come in this cool little package um, that has directions. It also tells you where to obtain more on the actual um, package. And then a water bottle, a stress ball, and uh, we've got the, their spray hand sanitizers. Um, so if you attend the webinar and then you want to be able to access those, uh, just come by Behavioral Health. We'll have some, some stuff set up for you. It may take a little while for us to get to get everyone their Narcan kits because unfortunately there seems to be a shortage on Narcan. <laughs> so I had contacted the pharmacy just yesterday um, and they said that they would get a hold of me as soon as their order comes in um, and we get it directly from Indian Health Services. So that should be available pretty soon. So without further ado, I am going to um, bring the PowerPoint up on the screen and um, I'm going to ask Lucy to do our presentation. Why did you share? Opioid overdose prevention and Narcan use training. When you come to our in-person training, we bring up the slide and I go along with the words. And if there's questions, we usually answer them. We have Dave over here. If you guys have a question during the presentation, just type them up and we'll get to them on the time. I have a question already. Lucy, um, Julia, would you like to hear it now or do you want me to wait till your presentation? The question comes from Jeff, and it is, does it come with a CPR rescue mask? It's a kit. It used to. We found that we asked why it no longer does, and they said that people were not using them. And then there was a shortage, too. Yeah. And they got really super expensive. Um, so when we go through the directions, um, Again, in this presentation, we'll talk about uh, rescue breathing. And not everybody is required to do rescue breathing because of the um, COVID precautions. We're recommending if you don't know somebody personally, that you may not be comfortable with that. And that's absolutely OK. Um, usually, a lot of times, just the administration of Narcan can help to get that person the oxygen that they need. Well, that's an excellent segue to the next question. The <laughs> next question is from Kathleen. The question is, is it okay to give Narcan without mouth-to-mouth? -mouth? With COVID and other saliva-transmitted diseases, I'm not comfortable with this procedure. Right. So I think you just addressed that. Yes. Yeah, we, we do that a lot. If, if we don't know how they use the drug, we don't want to get any heroin in our system. So we just yeah, just administer the Narcan if they're not breathing at all, chest compressions with pulse. I hope you all heard what Officer Hayfrey said there. He said that if they're not comfortable giving mouth to mouth, they simply administer the Narcan and uh, do compressions, chest compressions. Thank you for your questions so far. If you have more, just uh, keep them coming. We'll take it back to Lucy. Thank you. What are opioids? Opioids bind to specific receptors in the brain that reduce the transmission of pain signals throughout the body. Opioids include heroin, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, meperidine, morphine, oxycodone, codeine, fentanyl, and methadone. Opioid overdose occurs when a person has consumed more opioids than their body is able to process. 
The respiratory system is slowed down and the breathing can stop. Death occurs from lack of oxygen. Brain damage can occur from lack of oxygen to the brain. While an OD can be sudden, it can occur hours after an opioid is first consumed. Often others are around when ODs occur. A window for opportunity for intervention often exists. Among heroin users, about one in five will have a non-fatal overdose each year and about one in 100 will die. So like Caleb kind of mentioned in the video, he talked about uh, that opioid overdose is very quiet, um, non-eventful uh, process. And, and a lot of times it's depicted in movies and TV shows as being this like exaggerated thing. And it, and it really is, you know, something if you're not paying attention that you can miss. So the keys, are really those that ashy skin or blue lips, um, blue fingernails sometimes, uh, people breathing or snoring abnormally. Uh, it's, it's very subtle. Uh, it's so it's really important that you pay attention to what's going on with the people around you. And you know the people that you're around, you know how they breathe, how they sleep, if they're often with heroin or pills that people are using those, they nod out, they nod out, they nod out every few minutes. And sometimes it's different, you know how they are. And if they're breathing funny, they're struggling to breathe, you know that that's the point where you need to get help. Look for these signs of an overdose. Abnormal breathing can be woken up and the skin changes. When you are trying to wake somebody up if they've nodded out and if they are doing drugs, if you take your knuckles and rub it over your chest, that really does hurt. And if you don't get any response from that, you really need to call 911, administer Narcan. Clammy and cool skin sometimes. If it's hot out, they could be sweating. That's normal. But if it's not hot out, if it's cold in the house, they're they're not acting normal or they're, they're sleeping and their skin is cool and clammy, they're not responsive, you need to get help. Risks for opioid overdose include using opioids again after a break after inpatient treatment, a hospital stay, or jail, changes in tolerances occur. Taking pain medication more often or in higher doses than prescribed or using someone else's medication, the dose could be too much. Using heroin or pills bought on the street, heroin and street pills often contain other substances that can be dangerously toxic. Using opioids with alcohol or other drugs, including sleeping pills, benzodiazepine, benzos like Valium and Xanax, cocaine and methamphetamine, any current or chronic illness that weakens the heart or makes it harder to breathe. Using opioids alone, you're more likely to die from an overdose if no one is there to help. A previous overdose, a person who has overdosed before is more likely to overdose again. Like, <clears throat> A lot of times we see that when people either go to jail or they go to treatment, they're using a lot. When they come back, they think, oh, I can just go back to the same amount of drugs and it'll be fine. But when they do, when they were away for a week, two weeks, four weeks, your tolerance has changed. So you can no longer go back out into the streets and use the same amount of drugs you used before. So when they do that, they they OD, they need help, they need to be revived. When people share medication, like if your family member was hurt and you have had some old surgery medication in your cabinet and you offer that to them, that could be way too much for them. You don't know what their tolerance is or what a doctor might prescribe them for what ailments they might have. So they need to see a doctor and get their own pain medication prescribed to them or you don't know what kind of tolerance they might have. 
using heroin or pills bought in the street is seriously dangerous because fentanyl has been seen in a lot of heroin and counterfeit pills in King County. Heroin and fentanyl have been attributed to a lot of bogeys in the last few years. And they're finding more and more fentanyl too in methamphetamine. So yeah. it's not just opiates um, that they're finding this in. And they're also finding that it takes much less of fentanyl to cause a um, deadly overdose than it would of the, the heroin or the pills. You can't tell the difference between pressed pills that have fentanyl in them and actual pills that come from a pharmacy. Um, we give out tester strips for fentanyl as well with the needle exchange. So those can be very useful. Um, hopefully prevent an overdose for someone at some point. Uh, the other uh, medication that's important to understand about is especially with fentanyl and methadone. Methadone dosing is not the same as other opiate dosing. And so if you're not getting methadone from a clinic for yourself, you should never ever use it because it can be very dangerous and very deadly and it's long acting. So even if somebody does reverse your overdose with Narcan, you can go back into overdose. Um, especially if you don't seek medical help, which is the first step in any of the directions is to call 911. And that's one of the reasons why. Deaths caused by overdose between 2008 and 2020 in King County, Washington. The number and rate of overdose deaths has increased over the past decade. Overdoses are involved Opioids are involved in most overdose deaths. Fentanyl-related deaths increased significantly in recent years. Methamphetamine-involved deaths increased significantly in recent years. Most overdose deaths are attributed to multiple drugs. When we find that people have OD, um, most of the time they'll admit to using more than one drug. People like uppers and downers or downers and downers or uppers and uppers. They, they're usually using more than one thing. And when you do that, it, it's super dangerous because your body could just give out. It's being overworked to try to keep itself alive and normal. Just one thing to follow up on that. Uh, that is that's called potentiation when when we take various drugs at the same time it's called potentiation and how that works is our our body has a built-in mechanism to keep us at homeostasis so when we put a foreign substance into our system like methamphetamine like an opiate like like a pill with with opi opiates in it our body is working to get rid of that immediately because it sees it as an attack on our system on our homeostasis in our system. So it's busy fighting one fight, and then when we introduce another drug into the back door, it has a devastating effect on the human body because we can't take care of two things at once. Potentiation is one plus one doesn't equal two anymore. One plus one equals five or six. Potentiation is a killer. Thanks, Dave. Responding to an overdose. Try to wake them up. Rub your knuckles hard over their chest bone. If they don't wake up, they need medical help right away. Call 911. Tell the operator the person is not breathing or is barely breathing. This will get the highest level of medical response. Try to wake them up. Like, shove them. Hit them if you have to. Smack them on the cheek. Try really hard to wake them up. And if that doesn't work, Take your knuckles and rub it really, really hard over their chest bone. That really does hurt and it should get some kind of response. If it doesn't, then you need medical help. You call 911. After you call 911, you've got to tell them this person is not breathing. That will get them there so fast. If you tell them this person's intoxicated or this person is on drugs, 
you won't get them there as fast as if, if you tell them this person is barely breathing. Responding to an overdose, tilt the head back, lift the chin, pinch the nose, give two quick breaths, the chest should rise. If they don't start breathing, administer Narcan. Give one slow breath every five seconds, administer a second dose of Narcan if they don't respond to the first. A person won't necessarily know that they have overdosed when they regain consciousness. So again, if you're not comfortable giving the rescue breathing, don't. Only do that if it's somebody that you're comfortable doing that with. And always administer Narcan. Wait, I think it's two to five minutes. Mm -hmm. And if they still aren't breathing, then go ahead and uh, administer a second dose of Narcan. You're not going to hurt them by administering too much Narcan. There is no such thing. <clears throat> um, but the other important thing to understand is that when we say a person won't necessarily know that they have overdosed when they regain consciousness, they may be not happy when they wake up because all they'll know is that they may be experiencing some sudden withdrawal symptoms because you've just pushed all the opiates out of their receptor sites so that they can breathe again. Um, but they're not going to know that they weren't breathing, so they're not going to be happy about breathing, which they should be, but they won't be. Um, so be prepared uh, for a person not to thank you when you've just saved their life. At this point is when I show how the Narcan is used. If I could get a little closer here. Hold on. I got it. Go back to the. Now go ahead. Okay. If you can see, this is the Narcan here. You take your finger thumb at the bottom right here and your fingers right here. You put it in their nose about that far, about a quarter of an inch. You don't shove the whole thing in their nose and press. You do a quarter inch and then you spray the whole thing. It's a one-time use. And then you can continue with rescue breathing if you're comfortable with it. Do you have questions? No questions. Sorry. Narcan wears off in 30 to 90 minutes. When it does, the person could stop breathing again watch them until medical help arrives. Place the person into the recovery position on their side so they can breathe and won't choke on any vomit. If you must leave, put the person in a place where they can easily be found. Encourage follow-up medical care. Healthcare staff will relieve symptoms of withdrawal, monitor breathing and risks of another overdose, treat any other medical conditions. There is another question and it's brought to us by Marty. The question is, how long does it take Narcan to take effect once you administer it? Usually takes, at the least I've seen, a minute. The most I've seen, 10 minutes. That was on the video of the person being revived live on YouTube. Did yeah. they have to have it twice? They had it three times. Three I've only seen it administered twice once. Usually within five minutes, you, they start waking up and start seeing a response from them. And they don't, they're not usually violent, but they're usually really disoriented and confused about what's going on. Okay. And like uh, Julia said, I wanted to uh, you know repeat that she said two to five minutes. If you haven't seen any response to the first shot of Narcan, hit them again. You know, like she said, you're not gonna you're not gonna be affected by too much Narcan. Thank you for the question, Marty. Uh, the other thing that's really important to reiterate about this slide is putting that person on their side uh, in that position, because it would really, really be horrible to save somebody's life by reviving them from an overdose and then have them aspirate on their vomit, because it happens. 
um, and it can cause some terrible damage to their lungs. That was um, how a brother-in-law of mine passed away. He was brought back from an overdose, not an opiate overdose, um, but another medication overdose, and he aspirated on his vomit, and they ended up having to pull life support from him uh, two weeks later. Narcans are as often about 30 to 90 minutes. So if you have brought this person back and they are alert and they can function, it could wear off and they could fall back into an overdose. That's why we urge them to seek medical care, to go with the ambulance. Most of the time they don't want to go with the ambulance, but you want to tell them at the hospital is where they're going to be monitored by healthcare staff and they can relieve the symptoms of the withdrawal that they're now feeling and monitor their breathing and their risk for another overdose and treat any other ailments they might have. The Muckleshoot Indian Tribe distributes Narcan nasal spray through the pharmacy and behavioral health programs, the needle exchange, and first responders grant. It's designed to be easy to use without medical training and no prescription necessary. You, yeah. <laughs> I went through the demonstration already. Fentanyl, warning, be aware, beware of counterfeit pills that may look like prescription drugs. They likely contain fentanyl, a synthetic drug 100 times more powerful than opioids. Oxycodone pills that are sold on the street or online likely contain fentanyl. Do not consume any pill that you do not directly receive from a pharmacy or prescriber, whereas fentanyl shown up locally. In King County, fentanyl is most commonly seen in blue, greenish, or pale colored counterfeit pills they may be other colors. These pills may be marked as M30 and sometimes as K9, 215, and B48. Fentanyl may also be in white powders and more recently has been found in black tar heroin. These are, this is a picture of the pills I previously described. And those are counterfeit pills, but they do look like the purpose that 30 milligram pills that are on the street. So beware, people can hardly tell the real from the fake because if you look like, look at those, they do look real, they look, look, they look authentic, but they are fentanyl counterfeit pills. Fentanyl has been found in black tar heroin over uh, recent overdose deaths involve fentanyl in black tar. This is new in King County. Um, on the reservation, black tar heroin has exploded in recent years. Their, the use of black tar heroin is attributed to the pills not being easily found and have gotten more expensive, so that drove people to using heroin, a cheaper substance they could get easier. And both of these have risk of having fentanyl in them. So we have the fentanyl test strips that we distribute with the needle exchange. So people are, we're urging them to test for fentanyl because we don't, we don't know what's in the, what you get in the street. We don't really know what's in it. Don't leave a friend to die from a drug overdose. In Washington state, if you seek medical help for someone having an overdose, neither of you can be charged for having or using a small amount of drugs. The Good Samaritan Overdose Law protects you. Call 911. All this information that I've said tonight can be found at stopoverdose.org and the SAMHSA Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit and King County Public Health. Any questions? There are no more questions at this time. Do we have anything else to present, Julie? Um, no, that is pretty much it. Uh, Officer Hagrid, is there anything that you would like to share that I
that we didn't cover? No, not really. I mean, we basically covered the good scenario a lot in the video, but just emphasize for people to call. Don't be afraid to call. You're not going to get in trouble for having drugs on or around you. We're going to be there to help your friend or whoever's experiencing overdose. Thank you. I, I would like to uh, open it up one last time for if anybody has any questions. Uh, I would like to thank Lucy and Julia for their time and efforts. Officer Hagring, thank you very much for being here and, and being a part of this panel. Donnie, thank you very much for opening thing, things up for us. Really appreciate that. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.